In this talk, I am going to be introducing a new online resource called Fluron, a database of 18th century printer's ornaments. Um, so in the talk, I'm going to begin by explaining why Fluron was created, um, which means first outlining exactly what printer's ornaments are and what, what research questions led me to create a database of them. I will then explain how uh, Fluron was created and describe the methodology that was used um, and the practical challenges that were faced. I'll demonstrate how Fluron works and talk about the future of the project and some new features that are still in development or planned. I'm going to conclude by returning to the research questions that I'll begin with um, and broadening out to touch on some wider theoretical points that will have been raised along the way. So Fluron was created by a team of four researchers made up of me and three research software engineers, um, Filippo, Dirk and James. So I represent the humanities side of this digital humanities team. Um, my background is in the study of literature and the history of book production in the 18th century. Um, my specialisms will influence the content of the talk um, and maybe the discussion afterwards, but I will be presenting testimonies from the other members of the team um, about how they tackled the technical aspects of the project. So I hope that um, both the digital and the humanities aspects will receive um, enough attention. Uh, so to begin at the beginning, um, in the history of the production of printed books, the period known as the hand press period lasted in Europe from Johannes Gutenberg's invention of his press and movable type in around 1440 until the rise of the machine press from around the 1830s onwards. During this period, books were produced on manually operated presses and type, which was usually cast in metal, was arranged and set by hand, letter by letter. The way in which the vast majority of books are produced has changed largely beyond recognition between 1440 and the present day, with the exception of some small private hand presses. The general layout and design of a book, however, has barely changed at all. A page in a 16th century book and a page displayed on an e-reader are fundamentally the same in terms of their layout and general appearance. Just as early printed books were modelled on the layout of manuscripts, so digital layouts are modelled on printed books. Many of the most common modern fonts are even based on designs that were cut in metal in the hand press period, notably Caslon and Baskerville. But aside from rev revolutions in reading technology, perhaps the most striking change that's taken place between the hand press period and the machine era is the gradual but almost complete disappearance of decoration from inside books. Unless a book is illustrated, we're now likely to think of the front cover as the only place for decoration or embellishment. And we're accustomed to the interiors of books containing little to nothing beside the text, whether we're dealing with novels or scholarly monographs. Uh, we might just occasionally see a flourish at the beginning of a chapter, for example, um, but this is usually about it. Uh, we're used to seeing clean pages of text like this one. By contrast, Anyone who's used to looking at pre-19th century books will know that they're much more elaborately decorated than their modern counterparts. It wasn't just special books like Shakespeare's First Folio, which is what we're looking at here, that contained decorated chapter headings, endings, and initial letters. Everything from cookbooks to um, travel guides included um, printer's ornaments. They, these aren't illustrated books. Uh, the decorations are simply there to enhance, enliven, and beautify the text. Not every book contains ornaments, but they are enormously common during the whole hand press period. The practice of decorating initial letters, headings, and just about any blank space in a book evolved from scribal practices, particularly the lavish illumination of sacred manuscripts. The invention of printing allowed illumination to thrive in printed books as well. So the umbrella term for these decorative features is printer's ornaments, and they are the subject of the database that I'm going to be talking about today. Printer's ornaments as a term includes a number of different types of decoration. Woodcut ornaments, for instance, are the name um, given to ha designs cut, in hand in block cut by hand sorry, into blocks of wood. 
When a compositor was setting type, he or she would place a wood block along with the press, along with the type in the press, and the text and the ornament would be printed together at the same time on the press. The designers of woodcuts were highly skilled and they produced intricate ornaments. You can see a selection here. Um, they often depicted people and things as well as more abstract or floral designs and initial letters. The ornament on the middle right row is called a factotum from the Latin to do everything. Um, and the A there is not actually part of the ornament. It's a piece of type inserted into a hole left in the wood block for that purpose. This allowed one block to be used for any letter of the alphabet. It was also possible to cut similar designs in metal blocks, and these are known as metal, metal cuts. Occasionally, cast copies of original wood or metal cuts um, were made. And these were used in the same way. Another common type of printer's ornament is the printer's flower or fluoron. Unlike woodcuts, fluorons are actually pieces of type, just like the alphabetical pieces used to assemble a text. Only they feature small ornamental designs instead of letters. Just one or two of these could be used to create a tiny flourish, as you can see here, or many could be assembled into elaborate designs. This example contains 36 individual pieces of type. Arrangements of fluorons create non-representational geometric or floral patterns. Printer's ornaments and arrangements of fluorons constitute important evidence for bibliographers and book historians. Non-cast wood or metal cut ornaments are unique because they were cut by hand, which means they can act as a fingerprint. This is particularly useful in identifying who printed a book. Throughout the hand press period, printers quite often neglected to put their names on their publications. It was more common to give only the names of the publishers. The term publisher refers to the financial backer of the book, the person responsible for the marketing and selling of it. Unless a printer was self-publishing, the publisher was not involved in the manual labor of printing. If the printer of a book is unidentified, it's possible to identify him or her by their ornament stock. If we trace an ornament across multiple books, you can see it, uh, one ornament on two title pages here, um, and we, we will then usually find it in one with a printer's name on. And if we can find enough examples of this, we can confirm that books containing that ornament are likely to have been printed by the same person, even if they didn't put the net, their name to all their books. So in this example, the book on the left doesn't have a printer's name, the book on the right does. So the, the shared ornament is a clue that they also share a printer. If we look back at this image of a woodcut from earlier, we can see that the wood has cracked in the top right-hand corner, right through the man's face. There will be impressions in books of this ornament before and after the crack occurred. If we establish a general timeline from other books containing this ornament, which do have printed dates, they can help us to date books or pamphlets with no printed date. Ornaments also wore down and the impressions they made became less clear, so we can trace their life cycle quite closely with enough study. Fluorons can be used in a similar way. Assembling an intricate arrangement of fluorons with many pieces was delicate and time-consuming work. So once a completed arrangement had been assembled and used to print a book, the compositor might carefully remove it from the press and keep it made up to print another book. So here are two different books containing exactly the same arrangement of type, which would have been just lifted off the press. Pieces of type might become loose after a few uses. So unlike cut ornaments, these cannot be traced over long periods of time. But when they are present in two books, they tell us with certainty that both were printed in the same printing house and very close together in time. The identification of an unknown printer is of interest because it can help build a picture of where, how, and when a book was produced. Current research into printers is generally showing that they engaged with and influenced literary and political texts in much more sophisticated ways than was previously known. They were not only craftsmen and women and skilled laborers. The identity of printers can also help with other investigations, such as discovering the identity of an author. And being able to date texts more accurately has obvious utility for literary biography. Sometimes print 
pirated books can be identified by small differences between copied printer's ornaments. But there's a problem with the use of printer's ornaments as bibliographical evidence. It's very, very time consuming. We can easily find random examples of printer's ornaments just by leafing through books, but how do we trace one specific ornament across multiple books, particularly when we don't know in the first place which printer owned the ornament? The only way is by picking a date range and methodically searching through hundreds or thousands of books page by page. Bibliographers are notoriously persistent, and some individuals have identified the printers of thousands of books using this method, but this has often been the work of whole careers, and complete cataloguing of a printer's output this way is probably impossible. The mass digitization of books has made page-by-page -page searching much quicker than when it was dependent on calling up books in research libraries and handling delicate copies carefully. In addition to the ubiquitous Google Books, there are two excellent online resources for the study of hand press period books. Early English Books Online, or EBO, and 18th Century Collections Online, or ECHO. They are both based on the works listed in the English Short Title Catalogue, which means that they prioritise work printed in the British Isles and North America, but they also include thousands of titles from European countries. Together, they contain digital, sur digital surrogates of well over a quarter of a million titles, which is more than 50 million page images. Digital surrogates allow books to be searched page by page much more quickly than their physical counterparts but we still cannot actually pick out ornaments with ease. 18th century collections online allows the user to navigate to full page illustrations, which were manually tagged during the database's creation, but printer's ornaments have never been tagged on any database or their locations in physical copies indexed. This means that the locations of printer's ornaments remain a mystery. Therefore, we do not know basic facts about their usage. How often were they used? The best answer we have now is simply a lot. In which kind of books do they appear most frequently? We can only offer very general answers. Um, they seldom appear in funeral sermons, for instance. How does their usage vary by geographical region and country? When does their usage begin to decline? When were they used most? We don't yet know the answers to these questions. It was in order to answer questions like these and to speed up the process of finding printer's ornaments that I first conceived of the idea to create an online database of them. Such a database could not be created manually, even using pre-existing digital surrogates, because there are just too many printer's ornaments in existence. The database would have to be created using computer vision to detect and classify ornaments. Computer vision has been applied to printer's ornaments before, and previous attempts have taught valuable lessons. In 1996, the Polytechnic School of Lausanne and the Université Paul Valéry Montpellier created Passepartout, a searchable database of printer's ornaments. The database was last updated in 2000. Passepartout chose to scan images themselves rather than use an existing database, and their qualitative criteria were very precise. Scans were 200 dots per inch in image-cropped grayscale JPEG. The images could be searched using a computer program called TODAI, which stands for Typographic Ornament Database and Identification. This was developed in 1996. The program used orientation radi radiograms to match ornaments within the database. Whilst their initial, initial experiments were successful, Passepartout did not gather momentum because the process of scanning the books was too time consuming and expensive to allow the creation of a data set large enough to make a useful tool. The image search program worked well and allowed similar ornaments from within the database to be identified. However, Passepartout's program relied on the high quality scans being made at Lausanne. It was not created to deal with the low quality images found on the large databases we now have, like Echo and Ebo. Recently, a team at Oxford University, headed by Giles Bergel and Andrew Zissiman, developed a program called Image Match for Bodleian Broadside Ballads Online, a catalogue of single-sheet printed ballads. 900 17th century ballads were scanned by the Bodleian Library in Oxford specifically for the project. Using these high-quality scans, Bergel, Zissiman and their team employed a bag-of-words approach to, to develop an Image Match program, which allows image searching of the woodcut illustrations in, in the ballads. 
The tool is an excellent one, but again, it's dependent on high quality scans and a small data set. To make a database of printer's ornaments large enough to be useful for research into printer identification and other large bibliographical problems, it would be impossible to make new scans. That means it was necessary to work with a pre-existing database of digital surrogates. The books found on ECHO and EBO are not actually direct scans of books, they're scans of microfilms. The microfilms were made over a long period of time by many different libraries in the UK and America. This, means, this presents all sorts of problems for ornament detection using computer vision. The quality of the scans varies enormously. Books with tight bindings, for example, can't be opened so that the page is laid flat, which means the images appear curved. Others are blurred or over or underexposed. This is the same ornament from two different books from Echo, demonstrating the variation in quality that can occur. I nonetheless decided to use Echo to create the initial database. This meant it would contain printer's ornaments from the years 1700 to 1800. It made sense to pick only one of Echo or Ebo to begin with because they are owned by different publishers and organized slightly differently. In the long run, data from both will be integrated. The decision to start with Echo was motivated by my own research interests, which lie in the 18th century, but also by practical reasons. Echo contains more material from beyond the British Isles, which makes it more interesting for the study of ornament circulation and geographical trends. Perhaps more importantly, some of the very early material from Ebo may present problems for automatic detection of ornaments. There are many texts printed in black letter, for instance. Gale Sengage Learning, the publishers of Echo, agreed to provide the whole database on a hard drive so that we could set about extracting the ornaments. They also agreed that a new database of ornaments could be hosted on an independent website and that it did not have to join Echo behind its paywall. The hard drive they sent contained 32 million page images in individual TIFF files arranged in folders by volume. Each volume's folder also contained an XML file with the volume's metadata. This included information such as title, author, publisher, place of publication, year, and so on. The total size of all the data was two terabytes, which is a large data set, but not unmanageable, kept as low as could be hoped thanks to the low quality of the images. The challenge was to create an extraction program that could negotiate the quirks of ECHO scans and then to find a way of processing two terabytes of TIFF files in a reasonable time. One option was to use optical character recognition to identify the text and then to classify everything that wasn't text as a potential ornament. Issues like curved and blurred pages complicates the use of OCR on ECHO and the presence of manuscript annotations in some books and the inclusion of non-Latin alphabets made this impractical. So I recruited Dirk Gorison of Machine Doing Limited to develop a program to detect ornaments in the TIFF files provided by ECHO and then extract the ornaments into a new database along with their associated metadata. There are different ways to extract printer's ornaments, each with their own trade-offs. The approach Dirk adopted is a morphological one in which a series of morphological operations, including filtering, dilution, and erosion, is applied to each image followed by a series of heuristics to filter out those connected components that are deemed to be printer's ornaments. So as briefly as possible, here's a step-by-step -step guide provided by Dirk to how his code works. The images on the right show six steps of the process the code goes through in determining if a page contains an ornament. And Dirk's description of the process is on the left, which I'm going to summarize. So in the first frame, the image is pre-processed. Noise is removed and the image is thresholded so that it's no longer grayscale. Next, the lines of text are identified and removed. In the third and fourth frames, the image is heavily dilated so that the white lines are blurred and thickened. This will cause ornaments that are made out of many different separate elements to be joined together as a whole. This also has the side effect that the letters in the text may be glued together as well. This is dealt with later. More negligible contours are removed and then the decision is made as to whether the remaining areas are ornaments, full page illustrations, blobs of text or something else. 
This decision is made based on a set of heuristics. We know ornaments do not occur randomly. They're often centered with the text in the page, and if they're not centered, they occur in specific places, like capital letters, or they have specific aspect ratios, for example, dividers or headpieces. If they're made up of lots of little pieces, the size distribution of those little pieces is different to the size distribution of a line of text. If the code's not sure whether an area is an ornament or not, it tries to break it up into little pieces by looking at the original image again versus the dilated one, and run some tests to see if it actually isn't some glued together text after all. If it still can't figure it out, it errs on the safe side and treats it as an ornament. Finally, for each ornament, we find the bounding box, extract it from the image, save separately, and write a JSON file. This occurs in the final frame. Dirk initially worked with images like these, in which the ornaments are clearly distinct from the text and nicely defined. They appear on the expected places on the page, surrounded by white space. Dirk then moved on to tweak the code based on less cooperative Im images like these. In the image on the left, the decorated initial letter has no white space to the left-hand side because a tight binding has prevented the scanner from reaching the full margin of the page. It's also placed particularly close to the text on the right. The middle image features two arrangements of fluorons that we want to capture, but also manuscript notes and significant shadowing. This is a particularly tricky example. The image on the right does not contain any ornaments. It's from an almanac where the frequent appearance of tables and charts presents problems, as they disrupt the normal division between white space and content. This page also features the problem of show-through. The cheap, thin paper of an almanac means that the text from Overleaf is showing through in the top right-hand corner to, to this side of the page, creating a blurred area that may be mistaken for a non-textual element. This is where the code specification that an ornament has clear bounds comes into play. It's particularly important that the code is very permissive. It was much more preferable to identify as close to 100% of ornaments in Echo as possible, even if this meant accumulating a large number of type 1 errors, such as clusters of text, areas of show through, or parts of tables. This was preferable to refining the code further to exclude these elements at the risk of producing type 2 errors. I will come back to the consequences of this permissive approach shortly. We named Dirk's program Fluron after the pieces of ornamental type that it was in part designed to detect. The next step was to run Fluron on all 36 million page images. This was made possible by a collaboration with the recently established Research Software Engineering Group at Cambridge University Information Services, who work with Cambridge's high-performance computing cluster. My collaborators are Filippo Spiga, head of RSE, and James Briggs, research software engineer. James described the process of using the HPC cluster to run the Fluron program. This is his statement on the topic. He says, there are approximately 150,000 books in the entire catalogue. On a high-end Intel workstation, it takes on average about six hours to extract all the ornaments of just 50 books using Fluron. This means that it would take over two years to process the entire catalogue if we were only to use the workstation. For a problem of this size, an HPC cluster is the only tool that can get the job done in a reasonable amount of time. The books have been arranged into batches of 50, and each one of these batches is run on a single node of Darwin, the HPC cluster at the University of Cambridge. Assuming a job time of six hours per batch, if 50 nodes are used, then the entire catalogue could be processed in 15 days. In practice, the cluster is shared with many other users, so the actual expected time of completion will be approximately four to five weeks. As of today, we're about halfway through this processing time, so this is still a work in progress. In the meantime, we created a website to present the new database of printer's ornaments that's steadily being created. So this is officially the world premiere of Fluron, a database of 18th century printer's ornaments, which hasn't yet been seen by anyone outside the Fluron team. Uh, the site is being hosted on a temporary server and is easily overloaded with too many search queries at the moment. So I'll be showing screenshots from it during the talk, but I'm happy to give a live demo of the site uh, later on. We hope that the site will soon migrate to the website of the Cambridge University Library as part of their catalogue of digital resources. 
At the moment, Fleuron contains about 5,000 ornaments, so it's just a demo size uh, subset of the final data. So Fleuron allows users to search the database in three ways, by ornament, by book, or by browsing. Here is the book search page. It's possible to search for books by title, author, publication place, publisher, or ESTC ID, which is a unique ID number given to every book by the English short title catalog. The ESTC ID allows you to navigate directly to a specific book if you know what you're looking for. The other search functions are broader, and the date range function allows searches to be narrowed. Subject area allows searches within the subjects listed. So to give an example of a search, if I type Ovid into the search bar and tick author, um, the result I get at present is just one book by Ovid, um, but when the whole data set is available, um, there will be many more. If I click the title, The Art of Love, um, an edition from 1708, I am presented with the book details, which includes its bibliographical information, followed by images of all its printer's ornaments. Each ornament has been given a unique ornament ID number. These can then be searched again on the ornament search page to nav navigate directly back to a specific ornament. The page number on which the ornament appears in the original book is listed. And the, this edition of Ovid's Art of Love contains 55 ornaments. Here's a zoomed out view of part of the list as it appears on Fleuron. The ornament search page allows me to direct the search with information about the ornament rather than about the text it appears in. It contains a dimension search tool which is useful for viewing different types of ornaments. For example, headpieces will have a long width and a relatively short height. Um, so I can exclude small ornaments and individual fleurons and search for larger, more detailed ornaments if that's what I'm interested in. For example, specifying a minimum height and width of 300 and leaving the upper limit open with an asterisk returns larger initials and tail pieces. These results, returns can be refined further by city, date, publisher, etc. The browse function is self-explanatory. Um, browsing by location, for example, gives some sense of the geographical scope of the database. Many of the values here are one at the moment, um, but when all of the data is added, they will increase and we'll get a better sense of the spread of ornaments over the geographical areas included. So to return to the issue raised earlier of items in the database that were falsely identified as ornaments, here I've searched for James Boswell and found his account of Corsica of 1769. As you can see, amongst the ornaments are chunks of text that our permissive code has misidentified during the blurring process. Um, as a side note, the image at the bottom is a library stamp from the Bodleian Library, not a printer's ornament. Um, so there are other kind of items that can slip in under the radar. After the processing of all the image files is complete, the next step is to remove these errors, these chunks of text. There are far too many for this to be done manually. This is where we will use machine learning. Machine learning will likely provide a much more accurate way of discriminating the classes of false positives than tweaking the heuristics of the original extraction code could. Here's the proposed methodology for identifying and removing the false positives. After the data has been extracted, a labeled data set of about 1,000 images will be produced from a random subset of the images. The images will be labeled as either valid or invalid. Once this has been produced, we can then go about training different machine learning algorithms to automatically classify the images as valid or invalid. After this model has been trained and tested to have sufficient accuracy, we can then apply it to the entire data set. So we've built an admin interface for the website, which allows me to delete some invalid entries manually. These deleted image files are then moved into a new directory, which can also be used as a labeled data set for the deletion of false positives later. The issue of cleaning up false positives leads us on to the future of Fleuron and the new directions in which we plan to take the database. With its current features, Fleuron will already allow ornaments to be browsed and searched for with unprecedented speed and efficiency. However, the query that I originally envisaged Fleuron answering was one along the lines of, I have a book with an unknown printer, but it has a printer's ornament. Where else does this ornament occur? The most direct way to answer this query 
would be to create an image search tool like the one we saw on Passepartout and um, Bodley and Ballads Online. The most direct, um, sorry, uh, this would mean that instead of browsing ornaments from the year and location of the original, hoping to happen upon the same ornament again, matching ornaments could be identified with a single click. This is something that the Fleuron team is working on right now, um, but in 2014, I developed a proof of concept on this topic with another colleague, Andrew Newell, a computer vision specialist at University College London. We created a data set of 344 images from Echo. The data set contained two examples of each ornament, each taken from a different book, uh, so 172 pairs. Andrew was able to create a program that could match up the pairs of ornaments with a success rate of over 98%. He used a multi-scale version of the histograms of oriented gradient scheme in which an image may be described by the distribution of gradients or edge directions. The method worked very well in dealing with the low quality images found on Echo. We deliberately used a number of blurred, misshapen, or over-inked ornaments to test the resilience of the method. We will no doubt approach the problem in a new way now that we have a full, a full data set. I simply mentioned the 2014 proof of concept we devised to demonstrate that it is possible to create an image match tool that's not dependent on high quality scans. The next two features on my list are far more, spe uh, far more speculative and are not yet in development. Based on Echo's data set, Fleuron cannot be comprehensive since Echo does not include every book published in the 18th century, although it does include a number big enough to be very useful for research. But what, so what if a user finds an ornament in a book they're consulting firsthand in a library and they would like to look it up in Fleuron to find other appearance of it, of it in the database? But when they go to Fleuron, they find it's not there because the book didn't appear in Echo in the first place. At this point, it would be useful for the user to add their own image to the database and to receive instant matches with other images already included. This would also have the advantage of gradually increasing the quality and quantity of the data set over time. Another way in which crowdsourcing could be used to improve the database in future would be by allowing users to tag ornaments in the database with descriptive terms so that it would be possible to search for all ornaments containing, say, cherubs or mermaids, all the initial letter A's, for example. Uh, this shouldn't be too hard to implement, but it would take a lot of time to become really useful. Finally, on the subject of future developments, the integration of more data on a larger scale, rather than on a smaller, user-generated scale. There are already tentative plans underway by another team to tag the ornaments in early English books online, and we are already planning a collaboration to create an umbrella site that will be able to access both databases to perform searches across the whole hand press period. So to conclude my talk today, I will return to the question of new research directions. I laid out some of these at the beginning, and to recap, Fleuron will be of interest to bibliographers and book historians particularly those interested in printer identification, dating, piracy detection, and authorship. The ways in which the database will help with these questions, I hope, are clear. When all of the image files have been processed on the HBC and the false po positives removed, we will also have instant access to new statistics about the 18th century book trade that have never been possible before. We'll know which genre of books include the most and least ornaments, in which cities ornaments are most common, and when their usage had its peaks and troughs. What I haven't yet touched on is the importance of printers' ornaments as works of graphic design and art. Like these three examples, printers' ornaments can be intricate and beautiful and even striking and affecting. They can even tell us about life in the past. The example on the top right depicts the interior of a printing office, with the press in the foreground being operated by two men. I don't know if you can see this clearly on this reproduction, but the two compositors in the background are women. This ornament offers a rare glimpse at women in the workplace in the 18th century, a subject on which there's much research, but very few known visual resources. So there's a real treasure trove of discoveries to, make, to be made by bringing together printer's ornaments in one place and paying new attention to them. This leads to the final conclusion of my talk, which is simply to point to some of the larger theoretical issues at play behind the database of printer's ornaments. 
These might be topics to investigate further in the discussion afterwards. So what strikes me about Fluoron as a digital project is that its aim is to recover and bring to the attention a wholly neglected feature of the printed page. Digital technology is often seen as the enemy of print. This is a narrative we probably all know well. But on the subject of printer's ornaments, print, since the 19th century, has been its own enemy. It's hidden part of its own history, and it's only digital technology that can recover it. Not only have printer's ornaments fallen out of fashion in modern printing, modern scholarly editions of literary texts, however accurate and comprehensive, have almost always erased the decorative features of early printed books. We have editions of Shakespeare, for example, which reproduce the spelling and punctuation and layout of the first quartos and folios with the utmost fidelity, but it's very rare to find a modern edition even mentioning the presence of printer's ornaments in those quartos, let alone reproducing them in their places. A recent study of Samuel Richardson's great 18th century epistolary novel, Clarissa, found that different fleurons were used for different characters' letters. This kind of playful interplay between text and decoration is entirely lost in modern editions where the fleurons are not reproduced. So we can actually lose meaning and a vital part of the original reading experience by ignoring the decorative aspects of early books. Scholarship has broadly tended to separate art and literature, at least to some extent, and the images that appear in books have fallen between this gap. We're at a key moment in the development of the global digitized corpus, where projects like Fleuron, um, now that we have enough digitized material, can make a case for the reintegration of text and image through the creative redeployment and reclassification of already digitized material. Interestingly, however, despite being committed to the reintegration of text and image, Fleuron performs its own kind of segregation by removing the text from around the image and presenting the image alone. I quite like this about the database as it encourage us, encourages us to look at these images as images and not just as embellishments. But the choice of presentation wasn't made for that reason. It was made because a condition set by Gail Sengage, the owners of Echo, was that we didn't reproduce whole page images. All of the texts on Echo are out of copyright, but Gail Sengage owns the copyright to the page images, and they keep Echo behind a paywall, hence why they didn't want me reproducing whole, um, whole page images en masse. I don't think this necessarily detracts from the usefulness of Fleuron, but I think it's important to think about how the separation of text and image will nonetheless affect the interpretation of the ornaments collected there. This raises the broader question of how digitization affects interpretation. You can see from the ornament on the top left how scanned microfilms differ in appearance from photographs. Scanned microfilm creates a more homogeneous image uh, in which some of the grain and texture of the ornaments is lost. It's important, of course, to remember the meaning of the term digital surrogate. That is a substitute or representative, but not the thing itself. Fleuron is designed as a finding aid to enable the easy discovery of ornaments, which can then be re-examined in the physical book. But we shouldn't pretend that finding aids are never used as catalogues or galleries in themselves. They can take on a life of their own. So this is probably as good a point at any as which to invite discussion, questions and comments about the various uh, potential limits and theoretical implications of the Fleuron database. So thank you very much for having me and listening. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. That was great. And does anybody have any questions? Well, I might kick it off then. Um, I just, I'm just curious if you have your own thoughts on why we don't use ornaments anymore now. Um, I think it's because the, the hand-making process went out of printing with the arrival of the machine press. Um, so it was no longer necessary for compositors and um, type cutters to, to be hands-on and to be making these things by hand and to be seeing them through the presses themselves. I think there was probably quite a close connection between the printer and their ornaments, which characterized their books, which was lost as the industry became bigger. Um, and I think that probably 
It's a, sh it's a shame because they, they're great, but um, I think they were probably lost early on and then just never picked up again, even though they would be quite easy to create with a machine press anyway. And it wasn't common for different publishers to use the same ornaments. This is how you can tell. Um, they could lend them to each other, and they do lend them to each other, which is why you wouldn't usually like to make a printer identification based on just the appearance of one ornament um, in two books. So when you, when you identify a printer using printer's ornaments, you try and find multiple ornaments which they're using over time. And if you then find one ornament which you haven't seen before in their work, it's possible that that was borrowed. Um, so yeah, they, they, can, they can share them, particularly, as a, particularly in London, where a lot of the printers were very, very close um, together during the hand press period. Um, also, just, I'm just curious because I don't know anything about it, but it, there, was there a form of copyright then? Could it be that these ornaments were in a way kind of copywriting the text and you knew who it was from? And yeah, yeah, there was copyright. Um, it was a really sort of hotly contested issue, um, particularly the expiration of copyright um, wasn't adhered to by printers and printers all kind of moved into factions and protected copyrights which had legally expired so but they carried on protecting them and yes one of the ways was they um, used very recognizable printers ornaments maybe on the title page to kind of show authenticity um, but then you might get printers copying each other's ornaments to try and uh, copy their books it was part of the process of pri piracy was um, to copy ornaments Ooh. Thank you for, for this interesting talk. Um, I have two questions, actually. One is about the expansion of the data uh, into other uh, countries, um, uh, times, maybe. So uh, uh, as far as I got it, you, uh, you concentrate on English, uh, early English books, so 18th century. Uh, what's about France, Netherlands, both very important uh, areas of back production in that mm. time so for for research research purposes it would be uh, a very good uh, endeavor to uh, to expand everything to this to these areas or more parts of Europe uh, so that's the first question what what about your plans for this is there any uh, and I also think about of course Germany because we have this uh, VDH 18 uh, collection here, so the digitization of all the, uh, the 18th century books, 17th century books uh, mm. going on and almost done. So that would be also uh, material that you could, uh, yeah, pr uh, uh, you could uh, just proceed, proceed on, on this, uh, this algorithms that you're using here. Uh, and the second is a very uh, just uh, curiosity and personal question. Uh, any uh, pictures with uh, justice uh, available here in the printer ornaments, so like mm. pillories or uh, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> because I'm doing research on that, so uh, I just wonder because uh, uh, I see uh, 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 quite elaborate pictures of uh, scenes, and I know that uh, uh, justice uh, was a very important topic in, in, in early print uh, in 18th century, of course. And I wonder if there are these orna ornaments, uh, because of course there are pictures of all these things in the books. Maybe it also came into the ornaments. I don't, but I don't know that. So just curiosity. Yeah, um, I have seen ornaments containing pictures of justice before, um, holding scales with the blindfold. Um, I could probably even find one in a document that I have. But this is. This is one of the limitations of the database, which I touched on, is that it would be, it would be great to be able to tag the ornaments with um, descriptive terms so that a query like that could be answered. But that requires a lot of um, manual labor. So yeah, it's gonna be hard to find those things. But I do, I do know just from my work with ornaments that the, the figure of justice was included in printer's ornaments. Um, yeah, I think, it, yeah, definitely. And, and there's the, the subject, um, filter as well and we actually the metadata contains much more detailed subject filters than we've got on there at the moment which we're thinking of um, putting onto the site in a kind of advanced search page that you could search not just by literature but by
poetry and novels and you know etc and then you'd be able to look at law books and specific types of law books and see if these ornaments of justice appear there and I suppose then once you found one once we've implemented the image match tool you'd be able to find others that look similar so there would be ways of doing it um, but yeah it's it, they certainly exist um, on the topic of different countries um, there are books from Germany, France, the Netherlands in Echo and Ebo, so they will appear in this database. Um, they are outnumbered by British books. Um, this is just the way the English short title catalogue works. So a lot of we include a lot of English language printing from the Netherlands and France, which was very common, and there there is some um, printing in the native language as well. But yeah, then the next step would be to expand it using um, European pre-existing databases, which is something that we intend to look at doing. Uh, my question is that, that uh, can you tell us some words about the softwares uh, you use? About the what, sorry? The softwares, what kind of programs do uh, you created and whether it you plan to publish those softwares as open source or whatever? Yes, um, the software is open source and we do plan to publish um, it. I think it is already online, but um, it's not kind of advertised anywhere at the moment. So we will be linking to it from the website. Um, as far as saying more about how it actually works, it's not really um, my domain since I was, I, my colleagues were very much, um, very much rely on them to do that for me. So beyond the kind of descriptions that I've got my head around today, um, I can't say an enormous amount more um, other than that, yes, it will be open source um, and uh, reproducible, yes. We have another question over here. Yes. Is your database uh, connected to an institutional repository or it, does it stand alone? It stands alone at the moment, but it's looking for a home. Um, so <laughs> we're in talks. You consulted your university's yes. institutional repository? Yeah, we're in talks with the University of Cambridge Library. Um, so they are looking quite positive at the moment, although I can't be sure about taking it on as one of their um, digital resources, in which case it would be. Um, would it be incorporated into the, the repository? It, or? it would be incorporated it into their website, so it would receive a .cam.ac.uk web stay address. As a separate it, would, it would stay separate, but under their umbrella. Yeah, that's the idea. Your beautiful pictures reminded me of something I recently came across, which you might know, the Internet Archive Book Images Collection. It's a collection on Flickr, open. Oh, yeah. 54,000 pages of images. Uh -huh. And I don't know, I mean, whether they would be relevant to your work. Of course, I mean, they have insects here. It's not an ornament. Mm. But, uh, um, so is it illustrations? Illustrations, yeah. just cut out. Mm. So instead of maybe scanning entire pages, you could just import them, see if there's an ornament matching algorithm yeah. uh, you could use. But it seems like a huge resource. And I only came across it the other day and I yeah I was amazed by it mm. there's a there's a similar resource at the University of Cardiff they worked with the um, British Library and I think some other libraries and scanned loads of illustrative material from books and it's all online but hasn't been tagged as whether it's an illustration a woodcut ornament or what and they we've been in touch with them about possibly applying our code to their database to try and help them to figure out what what is ornaments and what's not. I think it would require some tweaking to work with different types of um, scan. I mean our code is kind of designed for these black and white low quality things and then a lot of these um, new databases include much more high quality color scans, full page images. So yeah it's an interesting question about how to how to work with other types of database that aren't just book directed. Second question, um, how long have you been working on this and is there a g project duration or when uh, did it start? I first started thinking about it in 2013-14, um, 
but didn't get far on it, apart from making this proof of concept with a colleague because I wanted to know if it was worth pursuing, whether it was possible to do some kind of image matching and extraction given the low quality of the images, and we found that it was. So then I started pursuing it properly in 2015, um, and it's all sort of recently snowballed and things have gone very quickly. There was a big delay in getting those hard drives um, from Echo with all the data. That took about nine months, I think, of just waiting for them to be shipped from America. So, yeah, there was a big delay where nothing happened, but it's all been gradually ticking over from 2013. Cool. Thank you for that talk. It was great. Any more questions? Thank you. Um, Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, actually, this is the idea of the GDDH to have this kind of talks so you would never see naturally. And um, I had the same question as you, but I have another question, um, or maybe a hint. So I think this is a kind of a lifetime job. So you can do this until you get pan get, uh, retired or even until you die. But <laughs> um, the question to me is, um, have you thought about, uh, if, if you think at a bigger scale, not just to um, put this on a website that you can use and you can search, but also to, for example, add an API that, for example, other portals or other data sources can connect with your resource. So this would simply may mean that you don't need to integrate everything, but you can say, this is my uh, scope. In this scope, I have this is this data in. However, with an API, you can integrate my resource via an whatever uh, to build uh, API uh, into your portal or into your data set. Have you thought about things like that? I, at yes. least I would recommend this. Yeah, no, we have. Um, I think I mentioned it very briefly in the talk because um, we were originally planning to do the same thing with early English books online as we did with Echo. But since we've been doing this, um, another team, it's actually some of the same people who set up the Bodley and Broadsides project, have decided they're working with the owners of early English books online to tag ornaments within that database. And they've already approached us about um, using an API to make both databases searchable. So yes, definitely. It's, it, I think it would be, I can't see any um, harm in it. It would be great to be able to extend the search as, as wide as possible. Um, I think at the moment there just aren't other databases that are tagging ornaments. Um, so it's not possible to to integrate with anything else yet, but it looks like it will be soon. It's becoming more of a, a topic of interest. Um, it's also designed to be kind of cross-referenced with 18th century collections mm -hmm. online. So you can't see the ornament on the full page, but you can then search for the same page within Echo and see the ornament in context. So they are intended to work together as well. Great, thank you. Any more questions? Oh, one, oh God, <laughs> be here forever, I'm sorry. Uh, just something that comes to my mind, uh, uh, connecting this with watermark da databases would be maybe mm. a good idea, uh, because it's both about uh, identifying printers and, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, API again would be a good idea <laughs> here to, uh, 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 when you have this in mind, so you, mm. you have, thought about uh, connecting the, this, this database maybe to a watermark da database to yeah. uh, scholars doing this uh, kind of research probably will use both uh, approaches to verify their uh, hypothesis or to prove that a particular book comes from this uh, office. Or mm. There's a fantastic um, database of uh, British armorial book bindings as well at the University of Toronto, which I think is very closely linked. Um, you find a lot of armorial designs are printers' ornaments, um, and they certainly share a lot kind of creatively, the kind of marks that people make in books, whether it's a watermark, something on the binding. Fleurons themselves originated as um, tools that were used to decorate the bindings before they were even used inside books. So yeah, it's certainly all related. Maybe this is a silly question. Can you cite an ornament? Can you, how would you, 
Yeah, um, this is probably what I'm trying to get to. URIs to identify an ornament, where exactly it appears on a page, link to it. Was this what you were referring yeah. to earlier? Yeah, this, well, we do have that information about exactly where it appears oh. on the page. That doesn't appear in the database at the moment, okay. but it could if yeah. that would be useful. Yeah. I'm trying to, it's a tricky balance between overloading the page mm. with information and f finding out what's mm. actually interesting to people. So you have the coordinates, so mm. to speak. So yeah, that, we do. those would be integrated in the URI, right? Yeah, okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, and we've given them all a, a, a unique identifier, but at the moment, no coordinates, but it could be done, yeah. Any more questions? Um, I've just got one last one, and it's more about the kind of operations of the project. Uh, do you have any students who help you out? Uh, how many of you in total? The four of you are the core team, or is it? Yeah, it's the just whole the four. Team? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm always interested in that. I just so setting up for such a project is always quite hard, and all the manual work has to be done. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and often students can really help. Yes. <laughs> um, so that was my question. So thank yeah, you ever so much. Um, great. Another great session.